section five of germinal by emile zola translated by havelock ellis this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Perard. part one chapter five maheu without looking at his watch which she had left in his jacket stopped and said one o'clock directly zachary is it done the young man had just been at the planking in the midst of his labor he had been lying on his back with dreamy eyes thinking over a game of hockey of the night before he woke up and replied yes it will do we shall see to-morrow and he came back to take his place at the cutting levaque and chaval had also dropped their picks they were all resting they wiped their faces on their naked arms and looked at the roof in which slaty masses were cracking they only spoke about their work another chance murmured chaval of getting into loose earth they didn't take account of that in the bargain rascals growled levaque they only want to bury us in it zacharie began to laugh he cared little for the work and the rest but it amused him to hear the company abused in his placid way Mahieu explained that the nature of the soil changed every twenty metres one must be just they could not foresee everything then when the two others went on talking against the masters he became restless and looked around him hush that's enough you're right said levaque also lowering his voice it isn't wholesome a morbid dread of spies haunted them even at this depth as if the shareholders coal while still in the seam might have ears that won't prevent me added chaval loudly in a defiant manner from lodging a brick in the belly of that damned dancer if he talks to me as he did the other day i won't prevent him i won't from buying pretty girls with a white skin this time zacharie burst out laughing the head captain's love for pierron was a constant joke in the pit even catherine rested on her shovel at the bottom of the cutting holding her sides and in a few words told etienne the joke while maheu became angry seized by a fear which he could not conceal will you hold your tongue eh wait till you're alone if you want to get into trouble he was still speaking when the sound of steps was heard in the upper gallery almost immediately the engineer of the mine little negrel as the workmen called him among themselves appeared at the top of the cutting accompanied by danseur the head captain didn't i say so muttered Mayo. there's always someone there rising out of the ground paul negrel monsieur hambault's nephew was a young man of twenty-six refined and handsome with curly hair and brown moustache his pointed nose and sparkling eyes gave him the air of an amiable ferret of sceptical intelligence which changed into an abrupt authoritative manner in his relations with the workmen he was dressed like them and like them smeared with coal to make them respect him he exhibited a daredevil courage passing through the most difficult spots and always first when landslips or fire-damp explosions occurred here we are are we not dansert he asked the head captain a coarse-faced belgian with a large sensual nose replied with exaggerated politeness yes monsieur Negrel. here is the man who was taken on this morning both of them had slid down into the middle of the cutting and made etienne come up the engineer raised his lamp and looked at him without asking any questions good he said at last but i don't like unknown men to be picked up from the road don't do it again he did not listen to the explanations given to him the necessities of work the desire to replace women by men for the haulage he had begun to examine the roof while the pikemen had taken up their picks again suddenly he called out i say there maheu have you no care for life by heavens you will all be buried here oh it's solid replied the workman tranquilly what solid but the rock is giving already and you are planting props at more than two metres as if you grudged it ah you are all alike you will let your skull be flattened 
rather than leave the seam to give the necessary time to the timbering i must ask you to prop that immediately double the timbering do you understand and in the face of the unwillingness of the miners who disputed the point saying that they were good judges of their safety he became angry go along when your heads are smashed is it you who will have to bear the consequences not at all it will be the company which will have to pay you pensions you or your wives i tell you again that we know you in order to get two extra trams by evening you would sell your skins Mehu, in spite of the anger which was gradually mastering him still answered steadily if they paid us enough we should profit better the engineer shrugged his shoulders without replying he had descended the cutting and only said in conclusion from below you have an hour set to work all of you and i give you notice that the stall is fined three francs a low growl from the pikemen greeted these words the force of the system alone restrained them that military system which from the trammer to the head captain ground one beneath the other chaval and levaque however made a furious gesture while maheu restrained them by a glance and zacharie shrugged his shoulders chaffingly but etienne was perhaps most affected since he had found himself at the bottom of this hell a slow rebellion was rising within him he looked at the resigned catherine with her lowered back was it possible to kill oneself at this hard toil in this deadly darkness and not even to gain the few pence to buy one's daily bread however negrel went off with dansart who was content to approve by a continual movement of his head and their voices again rose they had just stopped once more and were examining the timbering in the gallery which the pikemen were obliged to look after for a length of ten metres behind the cutting didn't i tell you that they care nothing cried the engineer and you why in the devil's name don't you watch them but i do i do stammered the head captain one gets tired of repeating things negrel called loudly Mehu, Mehu. they all came down he went on do you see that will that hold it's a two-penny half-penny construction here is a beam which the posts don't carry already it was done so hastily by jove i understand how it is that the mending costs us so much it'll do won't it if it lasts as long as you have the care of it and then it may go smash and the company is obliged to have an army of repairers look at it down there it is mere botching chaval wished to speak but he silenced him no i know what you are going to say let them pay you more eh very well i warn you that you will force the managers to do something they will pay you the planking separately and proportionately reduce the price of the trams we shall see if you will gain that way meanwhile prop that over again at once i shall pass to-morrow amid the dismay caused by this threat he went away dancered who had been so humble remained behind a few moments to say brutally to the men you get me into a row you hear i'll give you something more than three francs fine i will look out then when he had gone maheu broke out in his turn by god what's fair is fair i like people to be calm because that's the only way of getting along but at last they make you mad did you hear the tram lowered and the planking separately another way of paying us less by god it is he looked for someone upon whom to vent his anger and saw catherine and etienne swinging their arms will you just fetch me some wood what does it matter to you i'll put my foot into you somewhere etienne went to carry it without rancor for this rough speech so furious himself against the masters that he thought the miners too good-natured as for the others levaque and chaval had found relief in strong language all of them even zacharie were timbering furiously for nearly half an hour one only heard the creaking of wood wedged in by blows of the hammer they no longer spoke they snorted became enraged with the rock which 
they would have hustled and driven back by the force of their shoulders if they had been able that's enough said maheu at last worn out with anger and fatigue an hour and a half a fine day's work we shan't get fifty sous i'm off this disgusts me though there was still half an hour of work left he dressed himself the others imitated him the mere sight of the cutting enraged them as the putter had gone back to the haulage they called her irritated at her zeal let the coal take care of itself and the six their tools under their arms set out to walk the two kilometres back returning to the shaft by the road of the morning at the chimney catherine and etienne were delayed while the pikemen slid down they met little lydie who stopped in a gallery to let them pass and told them of the disappearance of moquette whose nose had been bleeding so much that she had been away an hour bathing her face somewhere no one knew where then when they left her the child began again to push her tram weary and muddy stiffening her insect-like arms and legs like a lean black ant struggling with a load that was too heavy for it they let themselves down on their backs flattening their shoulders for fear of scratching the skin on their foreheads and they walked so close to the polished rock at the back of the stalls that they were obliged from time to time to hold on to the woodwork so that their backsides should not catch fire as they said jokingly below they found themselves alone red stars appeared afar at a bend in the passage their cheerfulness fell they began to walk with the heavy step of fatigue she in front he behind their lamps were blackened he could scarcely see her drowned in a sort of smoky mist and the idea that she was a girl disturbed him because he felt that it was stupid not to embrace her and yet the recollection of the other man prevented him certainly she had lied to him the other was her lover they lay together on all those heaps of slaty coal for she had a loose woman's gait he sulked without reason as if she had deceived him she however every moment turned round warned him of obstacles and seemed to invite him to be affectionate they were so lost here it would have been so easy to laugh together like good friends at last they entered the large haulage gallery it was a relief to the indecision from which he was suffering while she once more had a saddened look the regret for a happiness which they would not find again now the subterranean life rumbled around them with the continual passing of captains the come and go of the trams drawn by trotting horses lamps starred the night everywhere they had to efface themselves against the rock to leave the path free to shadowy men and beasts whose breath came against their faces jeanlin running barefooted behind his tram cried out some naughtiness to them which they could not hear amid the thunder of the wheels they still went on she now silent he not recognizing the turnings and roads of the morning and fancying that she was leading him deeper and deeper into the earth and what specially troubled him was the cold an increasing cold which he had felt on emerging from the cutting and which caused him to shiver the more the nearer they approached the shaft between the narrow walls the column of air now blew like a tempest he despaired of ever coming to the end when suddenly they found themselves in the pit-eye hall chaval cast a sidelong glance at them his mouth drawn with suspicion the others were there covered with sweat in the icy current silent like himself swallowing their grunts of rage they had arrived too soon and could not be taken to the top for half an hour more especially since some complicated manoeuvres were going on for lowering a horse the porters were still rolling the trams with the deafening sound of old iron in movement and the cages were flying up disappearing in the rain which fell from the black hole below the sump a cesspool ten metres deep filled with this streaming water also exhaled its muddy moisture men were constantly moving around this shaft pulling the signal cords pressing on the arms of levers in the midst of this spray in which their garments were soaked the reddish light of three open lamps cut out great moving shadows and gave to this subterranean hall the air of a villainous cavern some bandit's forge 
near a torrent maheu made one last effort he approached Piron, who had gone on duty at six o'clock here you might as well let us go up but the porter a handsome fellow with strong limbs and a gentle face refused with a frightened gesture impossible asked the captain they would find me fresh growls were stifled catherine bent forward and said in etienne's ear come and see the stable then that's a comfortable place and they had to escape without being seen for it was forbidden to go there it was on the left at the end of a short gallery twenty-five metres in length and nearly four high cut in the rock and vaulted with bricks it could contain twenty horses it was in fact comfortable there there was a pleasant warmth of living beasts the good odour of fresh and well-kept litter the only lamp threw out the calm rays of a night light there were horses there at rest who turned their heads with their large infantine eyes then went back to their hay without haste like fat well-kept workers loved by everybody but as catherine was reading aloud their names written on zinc plates over the mangers she uttered a slight cry seeing something suddenly rise before her it was moquette who emerged in fright from a pile of straw in which she was sleeping on monday when she was overtired with her sunday spree she gave herself a violent blow on the nose and left her cutting under the pretence of seeking water to bury herself here with the horses in the warm litter her father being weak with her allowed it and at the risk of getting into trouble just then mock the father entered a short bald worn-out-looking man but still stout which is rare in an old miner of fifty since he had been made a groom he chewed to such a degree that his gums bled in his black mouth on seeing the two with his daughter he became angry what are you up to there all of you come up the jades bringing a man here it's a fine thing to come and do your dirty tricks in my straw moquette thought it funny and held her sides but etienne feeling awkward moved away while catherine smiled at him as all three returned to the pit-eye bebert and jeanlin arrived there also with a train of tubs there was a stoppage for the manoeuvring of the cages and the young girl approached their horse caressed it with her hand and talked about it to her companion it was Bate, the doyen of the mine a white horse who had lived below for ten years these ten years he had lived in this hole occupying the same corner of the stable doing the same task along the black galleries without ever seeing daylight very fat with shining coat and a good-natured air he seemed to lead the existence of a sage sheltered from the evils of the world above in this darkness too he had become very cunning the passage in which he worked had grown so familiar to him that he could open the ventilation doors with his head and he lowered himself to avoid knocks at the narrow spots without doubt also he counted his turns for when he had made the regulation number of journeys he refused to do any more and had to be led back to his manger now that old age was coming on his cat's eyes were sometimes dimmed with melancholy perhaps he vaguely saw again in the depths of his obscure dreams the mill at which he was born near marchienne a mill placed on the edge of the scarp surrounded by large fields over which the wind always blew something burnt in the air an enormous lamp the exact appearance of which escaped his beast's memory and he stood with lowered head trembling on his old feet making useless efforts to recall the sun meanwhile the manoeuvres went on in the shaft the signal hammer had struck four blows and the horse was being lowered there was always excitement at such a time for it sometimes happened that the beast was seized by such terror that it was landed dead when put into a net at the top it struggled fiercely then when it felt the ground no longer beneath it it remained as if petrified and disappeared without a quiver of the skin with enlarged and fixed eyes this animal being too big to pass between the guides it had been necessary when hooking it beneath the cage to pull down the head and attach it to the flanks 
the descent lasted nearly three minutes the engine being slowed as a precaution below the excitement was increasing what then was he going to be left on the road hanging in the blackness at last he appeared in his stony immobility his eye fixed and dilated with terror it was a bay horse hardly three years of age called trompette attention cried father mock whose duty it was to receive it bring him here don't undo him yet trompette was soon placed on the metal floor in a mass still he did not move he seemed in a nightmare in this obscure infinite hole this deep hall echoing with tumult they were beginning to unfasten him when bataille who had just been unharnessed approached and stretched out his neck to smell this companion who lay on the earth the workman jokingly enlarged the circle well what pleasant odour did he find in him but bataille deaf to mockery became animated he probably found in him the good odour of the open air the forgotten odour of the sun on the grass and he suddenly broke out into a sonorous neigh full of musical gladness in which there seemed to be the emotion of a sob it was a greeting the joy of those ancient things of which a gust had reached him the melancholy of one more prisoner who would not ascend again until death ah that animal bate shouted the workmen amused at the antics of their favourite he's talking with his mate trompette was unbound but still did not move he remained on his flank as if he still felt the net restraining him garroted by fear at last they got him up with a lash of the whip dazed and his limbs quivering and father mock led away the two beasts fraternizing together here is it ready yet asked maheu it was necessary to clear the cages and besides it was yet ten minutes before the hour for ascending little by little the stalls emptied and the miners returned from all the galleries there were already some fifty men there damp and shivering their inflamed chests panting on every side Perron, in spite of his mawkish face struck his daughter lydie because she had left the cutting before time zachary slyly pinched moquette with a joke about warming himself but the discontent increased chaval and levaque narrated the engineer's threat the tram to be lowered in price and the planking paid separately and exclamations greeted the scheme a rebellion was germinating in this little corner nearly six hundred metres beneath the earth soon they could not restrain their voices these men soiled by coal and frozen by the delay accused the company of killing half their workers at the bottom and starving the other half to death etienne listened trembling quick quick repeated the captain richon to the porters he hastened the preparations for the ascent not wishing to be hard pretending not to hear however the murmurs became so loud that he was obliged to notice them they were calling out behind him that this would not last always and that one fine day the whole affair would be smashed up you're sensible he said to maheu make them hold their tongues when one hasn't got power one must have sense but maheu who was getting calm and had at last become anxious did not interfere suddenly the voices fell negrel and Densard, returning from their inspection entered from a gallery both of them sweating the habit of discipline made the men stand in rows while the engineer passed through the group without a word he got into one tram and the head captain into another the signal was sounded five times ringing for the butcher's meat as they said for the masters and the cage flew up in the air in the midst of a gloomy silence End of section five. Section six of Germinal by Emile Zola, translated by Havelock Ellis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Part one, chapter six. As he ascended in the cage, heaped up with four others, Etienne resolved to continue his famished course along the roads. 
one might as well die at once as go down to the bottom of that hell where it was not even possible to earn one's bread catherine in the tram above him was no longer at his side with her pleasant enervating warmth and he preferred to avoid foolish thoughts and to go away for with his wider education he felt nothing of the resignation of this flock he would end by strangling one of the masters suddenly he was blinded the ascent had been so rapid that he was stunned by the daylight and his eyelids quivered in the brightness to which he had already grown unaccustomed it was none the less a relief to him to feel the cage settle on to the bars a lander opened the door and a flood of workmen leapt out of the trams i say moquette whispered zacharie in the lander's ear are we off to the volcan to-night the volcan was a cafe concert at monceau moquette winked his left eye with a silent laugh which made his jaws gape short and stout like his father he had the impudent face of a fellow who devours everything without care for the morrow just then moquette came out in her turn and he gave her a formidable smack on the flank by way of fraternal tenderness etienne hardly recognized the lofty nave of the receiving hall which had before looked imposing in the ambiguous light of the lanterns it was simply bare and dirty a dull light entered through the dusty windows the engine alone shone at the end with its copper the well-greased steel cables moved like ribbons soaked in ink and the pulleys above the enormous scaffold which supported them the cages the trams all this prodigality of metal made the hall look sombre with their hard grey tones of old iron without ceasing the rumbling of the wheels shook the metal floor while from the coal thus put in motion there arose a fine charcoal powder which powdered black the soil the walls even the joists of the steeple but chaval after glancing at the table of counters in the receiver's little glass office came back furious he had discovered that two of their trams had been rejected one because it did not contain the regulation amount the other because the coal was not clean this finishes the day he cried twenty sous less again this is because we take on lazy rascals who use their arms as a pig does his tail and a sidelong look at etienne completed his thought the latter was tempted to reply by a blow then he asked himself what would be the use since he was going away this decided him absolutely it's not possible to do it right the first day said maheu to restore peace he'll do better to-morrow they were all none the less soured and disturbed by the need to quarrel as they passed to the lamp cabin to give up their lamps levaque began to abuse the lamp man whom he accused of not properly cleaning his lamp they only slackened down a little in the shed where the fire was still burning it had even been too heavily piled up for the stove was red and the vast room without a window seemed to be in flames to such a degree did the reflection make bloody the walls and there were grunts of joy all the backs were roasted at a distance till they smoked like soup when their flanks were burning they cooked their bellies moquette had tranquilly let down her breeches to dry her chemise some lads were making fun of her they burst out laughing because she suddenly showed them her posterior a gesture which in her was the extreme expression of contempt i'm off said chaval who had shut up his tools in his box no one moved only moquette hastened and went out behind him on the pretext that they were both going back to monceau but the others went on joking they knew that he would have no more to do with her catherine however who seemed preoccupied was speaking in a low voice to her father the latter was surprised then he agreed with a nod and calling etienne to give him back his bundle listen he said you haven't a sou you will have time to starve before the fortnight's out shall i try and get you credit somewhere the young man stood for a moment confused he had been just about to claim his thirty sous and go but shame restrained him before the young girl she looked at him fixedly perhaps she would think he was shirking the work you know i can promise you nothing 
Maheu went on. They can but refuse us. Then Etienne consented. They would refuse. Besides, it would bind him to nothing. He could still go away after having eaten something. Then he was dissatisfied at not having refused, seeing Catherine's joy, a pretty laugh, a look of friendship, happy at having been useful to him. What was the good of it all? When they had put on their sabots and shut their boxes, the Mayhews left the shed, following their comrades, who were leaving one by one after they had warmed themselves. Etienne went behind. Levaque and his urchin joined the band. But as they crossed the screening place, a scene of violence stopped them. It was in a vast shed, with beams blackened by the powder and large shutters, through which blew a constant current of air the coal trams arrived straight from the receiving room and were then overturned by the tipping cradles on to hoppers long iron slides and to right and to left of these the screeners mounted on steps and armed with shovels and rakes separated the stone and swept together the clean coal which afterwards fell through funnels into the railway wagons beneath the shed philomene levaque was there thin and pale with the sheep-like face of a girl who spat blood with head protected by a fragment of blue wool and hands and arms black to the elbows she was screening beneath an old witch the mother of Piron, the brule as she was called with terrible owl's eyes and a mouth drawn in like a miser's purse they were abusing each other the young one accusing the elder of raking her stones so that she could not get a basket full in ten minutes they were paid by the basket and these quarrels were constantly arising hair was flying and hands were making black marks on red faces give it her bloody well cried zacharie from above to his mistress all the screeners laughed but the brule turned snappishly on the young man now then dirty beast you'd better to own the two kids you have filled her with fancy that a slip of eighteen who can't stand straight maheu had to prevent his son from descending to see as he said the colour of this carcass's skin a foreman came up and the rakes again began to move the coal one could only see all along the hoppers the round backs of women squabbling incessantly over the stones outside the wind had suddenly quieted a moist cold was falling from a grey sky the colliers thrust out their shoulders folded their arms and set forth irregularly with a rolling gait which made their large bones stand out beneath their thin garments in the daylight they looked like a band of negroes thrown into the mud some of them had not finished their bricks and the remains of the bread carried between the shirt and the jacket made them humpbacked hello there's bottaloup said zacharie grinning levaque without stopping exchanged two sentences with his lodger a big dark fellow of thirty-five with a placid honest air is the soup ready louis i believe it is then the wife is good-humoured to-day yes i believe she is other miners bound for the earth cutting came up new bands which one by one were engulfed in the pit it was the three o'clock descent more men for the pit to devour the gangs who would replace the sets of the pikemen at the bottom of the passages the mine never rested day and night human insects were digging out the rock six hundred metres below the beetroot fields however the youngsters went ahead jeanlin confided to Bever a complicated plan for getting four sous worth of tobacco on credit while lady followed respectfully at a distance catherine came with zacharie and etienne none of them spoke and it was only in front of the advantage inn that maheu and levaque rejoined them here we are said the former to etienne will you come in they separated catherine had stood a moment motionless gazing once more at the young man with her large eyes full of greenish limpidity like spring water the crystal deepened the more by her black face she smiled and disappeared with the others on the road that led up to the settlement the inn was situated between the village and the mine at the crossing of two roads it was a two-storied brick house whitewashed from top to bottom enlivened around the windows by a broad pale blue border 
on a square sign board nailed above the door one read in yellow letters a la avantage license to rasseneur behind it stretched a skittle ground enclosed by a hedge the company who had done everything to buy up the property placed within its vast territory was in despair over this inn in the open fields at the very entrance of the Verreaux. go in said maheu to etienne the little parlour was quite bare with its white walls its three tables and its dozen chairs its deal counter about the size of a kitchen dresser there were a dozen glasses at most three bottles of liqueur a decanter a small zinc tank with a pewter tap to hold the beer and nothing else not a figure not a little table not a game in the metal fireplace which was bright and polished a coal fire was burning quietly on the flags a thin layer of white sand drank up the constant moisture of this water-soaked land a glass ordered maheu of a big fair girl a neighbour's daughter who sometimes took charge of the place is rasseneur in the girl turned the tap replying that the master would soon return in a long slow gulp the miner emptied half his glass to sweep away the dust which filled his throat he offered nothing to his companion one other customer a damp and besmeared miner was seated before the table drinking his beer in silence with an air of deep meditation a third entered was served in response to a gesture paid and went away without uttering a word but a stout man of thirty-eight with a round-shaven face and a good-natured smile now appeared it was rasseneur a former pikeman whom the company had dismissed three years ago after a strike a very good workman he could speak well put himself at the head of every opposition and had at last become the chief of the discontented his wife already held a license like many miners wives and when he was thrown on to the street he became an innkeeper himself having found the money he placed his inn in front of the Varol as a provocation to the company now his house had prospered it had become a centre and he was enriched by the animosity he had gradually fostered in the hearts of his old comrades this is a lad i hired this morning said maheu at once have you got one of your two rooms free and will you give him credit for a fortnight rasseneur's broad face suddenly expressed great suspicion he examined etienne with a glance and replied without giving himself the trouble to express any regret my two rooms are taken can't do it the young man expected this refusal but it hurt him nevertheless and he was surprised at the sudden grief he experienced in going no matter he would go when he had received his thirty sous the miner who was drinking at a table had left others one by one continued to come in to clear their throats then went on their road with the same slouching gait it was a simple swelling without joy or passion the silent satisfaction of a need then there's no news rasseneur asked in a peculiar tone of maheu who was finishing his beer in small gulps the latter turned his head and saw that only etienne was near there's been more squabbling yes about the timbering he told the story the innkeeper's face reddened swelling with the emotion which flamed in his skin and eyes at last he broke out well well if they decide to lower the price they are done for etienne constrained him however he went on throwing sidelong glances in his direction and there were reticences and implications he was talking of the manager m hanbeau of his wife of his nephew the little negrel without naming them repeating that this could not go on that things were bound to smash up one of these fine days the misery was too great and he spoke of the workshops that were closing the workers who were going away during the last month he had given more than six pounds of bread a day he had heard the day before that m denolin the owner of a neighbouring pit could scarcely keep going he had also received a letter from lille full of disturbing details you know he whispered it comes from that person you saw here one evening but he was interrupted his wife entered in her turn a tall woman lean and keen with a long nose and violet cheeks she was a much more radical politician than her husband 
Clouchard's letter, she said. Ah, if that fellow was master, things would soon go better. Etienne had been listening for a moment. He understood and became excited over these ideas of misery and revenge. This name, suddenly uttered, caused him to start. He said aloud, as if in spite of himself, I know him, Clouchard. They looked at him. He had to add, Yes, I am an engine man. He was my foreman at Lille, a capable man. I have often talked with him. Rasseneur examined him afresh, and there was a rapid change on his face, a sudden sympathy. At last he said to his wife, It's Mayhew who brings me this gentleman, one of his putters, to see if there is a room for him upstairs, and if we can give him credit for a fortnight. Then the matter was settled in four words. There was a room. The lodger had left that morning and the innkeeper who was very excited talked more freely repeating that he only asked possibilities from the masters without demanding like so many others things that were too hard to get his wife shrugged her shoulders and demanded justice absolutely good evening interrupted maheu all that won't prevent men from going down and as long as they go there will be people working themselves to death look how fresh you are these three years that you've been out of it yes i'm very much better declared rasseneur complacently etienne went as far as the door thanking the miner who was leaving but the latter nodded his head without adding a word and the young man watched him painfully climb up the road to the settlement madame rasseneur occupied with serving customers asked him to wait a minute when she would show him his room where he could clean himself should he remain he again felt hesitation a discomfort which made him regret the freedom of the open road the hunger beneath the sun endured with the joy of being one's own master it seemed to him that he had lived years from his arrival on the pit bank in the midst of squalls to those hours passed under the earth on his belly in the black passages and he shrank from beginning again it was unjust and too hard his man's pride revolted at the idea of becoming a crushed and blinded beast while etienne was thus debating with himself his eyes wandering over the immense plain gradually began to see it clearly he was surprised he had not imagined the horizon was like this when old bonbard had pointed it out to him in the darkness before him he plainly saw the Verreau in a fold of the earth with its wood and brick buildings the tarred screening shed the slate-covered steeple the engine-room and the tall pale red chimney all massed together with that evil air but around these buildings the space extended and he had not imagined it so large changed into an inky sea by the ascending waves of coal soot bristling with high trestles which carried the rails of the footbridges encumbered in one corner with the timber supply which looked like the harvest of a mown forest towards the right the pit-bank hid the view colossal as a barricade of giants already covered with grass in its older part consumed at the other end by an interior fire which had been burning for a year with a thick smoke leaving at the surface in the midst of the pale grey of the slates and sandstones long trails of bleeding rust then the fields unrolled the endless fields of wheat and beetroot naked at this season of the year marshes with scanty vegetation cut by a few stunted willows distant meadows separated by slender rows of poplars very far away little pale patches indicated towns marchiennes to the north monceau to the south while the forest of vandame to the east bordered the horizon with the violet line of its leafless trees and beneath the livid sky in the faint daylight of this winter afternoon it seemed as if all the blackness of the Verreau and all its flying coal dust had fallen upon the plain powdering the trees sanding the roads sowing the earth etienne looked and what especially surprised him was a canal the canalized stream of the scarp which he had not seen in the night from the Verreau to marchand this canal ran straight like a dull silver ribbon two leagues long an avenue lined by large trees raised above the low earth 
threading into space with the perspective of its green banks its pale water into which glided the vermilion of the boats near one pit there was a wharf with moored vessels which were laden directly from the trams at the footbridges afterwards the canal made a curve sloping by the marshes and the whole sole of that smooth plain appeared to lie in this geometrical stream which traversed it like a great road carting coal and iron etienne's glance went up from the canal to the settlement built on the height of which he could only distinguish the red tiles then his eyes rested again at the bottom of the clay slope toward the barrow on two enormous masses of bricks made and burnt on the spot a branch of the company's railroad passed behind a paling for the use of the pit they must be sending down the last miners to the earth cutting only one shrill note came from a truck pushed by men one felt no longer the unknown darkness the inexplicable thunder the flaming of mysterious stars afar the blast furnaces and the coke kilns had paled with the dawn there only remained unceasingly the escapement of the pump always breathing with the same thick long breath the ogre's breath of which he could now see the grey steam and which nothing could satiate then etienne suddenly made up his mind perhaps it seemed to see again catherine's clear eyes up there at the entrance to the settlement perhaps rather it was the wind of revolt which came from the Baron. he did not know but he wished to go down again to the mine to suffer and to fight and he thought fiercely of those people bonmart had talked of the crouching and sated god to whom ten thousand starving men gave their flesh without knowing it End of section six. Section seven of Germinal by Emile Zola, translation by Havelock Ellis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Part two, chapter one. The Gregoire's property, Piolaine, was situated two kilometers to the east of. Monceau, on the Oiselle Road, the house was a large square building without style, dating from the beginning of the last century. Of all the land that once belonged to it, there only remained some thirty hectares, enclosed by walls and easy to keep up. The orchard and kitchen garden, especially, were everywhere spoken of, being famous for the finest fruit and vegetables in the country. For the rest, there was no park only a small wood the avenue of old limes a vault of foliage three hundred metres long reaching from the gate to the porch was one of the curiosities of this bare plain on which one could count the large trees between marchien and Beaugeny. on that morning the gargoire got up at eight o'clock usually they never stirred until an hour later being heavy sleepers but last night's tempest had disturbed them and while her husband had gone at once to see if the wind had made any havoc madame gregoire went down into the kitchen in her slippers and flannel dressing-gown she was short and stout about fifty-eight years of age and retained a broad surprised dollish face beneath the dazzling whiteness of her hair melanie she said to the cook suppose you were to make the brioche this morning since the dough is ready mademoiselle will not get up for half an hour yet and she can eat it with her chocolate eh it will be a surprise the cook a lean old woman who had served them for thirty years laughed <laughs> that is true it will be a famous surprise my stove is alight and the oven must be hot and then honorine can help me a bit honorine a girl of some twenty years who had been taken in as a child and brought up in the house now acted as housemaid besides these two women the only other servant was the coachman francis who undertook the heavy work a gardener and his wife were occupied with the vegetables the fruit the flowers and the poultry yard and as service here was patriarchal this little world lived together like one large family on very good terms madame gregoire who had planned the surprise of the brioche in bed waited to see the dough put 
in the oven the kitchen was very large and one guessed it was the most important room in the house by its extreme cleanliness and by the arsenal of saucepans utensils and pots which filled it it gave an impression of good feeding provisions abounded hanging from hooks or in cupboards and let it be well glazed won't you madame grégoire said as she passed into the dining-room in spite of the hot air stove which warmed the whole house a coal fire enlivened this room in other respects it exhibited no luxury a large table chairs a mahogany sideboard only two deep easy chairs betrayed a love of comfort long happy hours of digestion they never went into the drawing-room they remained here in a family circle just then monsieur grégoire came back dressed in a thick faustian jacket he also was ruddy for his sixty years with large good-natured honest features beneath the snow of his curly hair he had seen the coachman and the gardener there had been no damage of importance nothing but a fallen chimney-pot every morning he liked to give a glance round Bialin, which was not large enough to cause him anxiety and from which he derived all the happiness of ownership and cecile he asked isn't she up yet then i can't make it out replied his wife i thought i heard her moving the table was set there were three cups on the white cloth they sent honorine to see what had become of mademoiselle but she came back immediately restraining her laughter stifling her voice as if she were still upstairs in the bedroom oh if monsieur and madame could see mademoiselle she sleeps oh she sleeps like an angel i can't imagine it it's a pleasure to look at her the father and mother exchanged tender looks he said smiling will you come and see the poor little darling she murmured i'll come and they went up together the room was the only luxurious one in the house it was draped in blue silk and the furniture was lacquered white with blue tracery a spoilt child's whim which her parents had gratified in the vague whiteness of the bed beneath the half-light which came through a curtain that was drawn back the young girl was sleeping with her cheek resting on her naked arm she was not pretty too healthy and too vigorous condition fully developed at eighteen but she had superb flesh the freshness of milk with her chestnut hair her round face and little wilful nose lost between her cheeks the coverlet had slipped down and she was breathing so softly that her respiration did not even lift her already well-developed bosom that horrible wind must have prevented her from closing her eyes said the mother softly the father imposed silence with a gesture both of them leant down and gazed with adoration on this girl in her virgin nakedness whom they had desired so long and who had come so late when they had no longer hoped for her they found her perfect not at all too fat and could never feed her sufficiently and she went on sleeping without feeling them near her with their faces against hers however a slight movement disturbed her motionless face they feared that they would wake her and went out on tiptoe hush said monsieur grégoire at the door if she has not slept we must leave her sleeping as long as she likes the darling agreed madame grégoire we will wait they went down and seated themselves in the easy chairs in the dining-room while the servants laughing at mademoiselle's sound sleep kept the chocolate on the stove without grumbling he took up a newspaper she knitted a large woolen quilt it was very hot and not a sound was heard in the silent house the grégoire's fortune about forty thousand francs a year was entirely invested in a share of the monceau mines they would complacently narrate its origin which dated from the very formation of the company towards the beginning of the last century there had been a mad search for coal between lille and valenciennes the success of those who held the concession which was afterwards to become the anzin company had turned all heads in every commune the ground was tested and societies were formed and concessions grew up in a night but among all the obstinate seekers of that epoch baron de ramon had certainly left the reputation for the most heroic intelligence for forty years he had struggled without yielding in the midst of continual obstacles early searches 
unsuccessful new pits abandoned at the end of long months of work landslips which build up borings sudden inundations which drowned the workmen hundreds of thousands of francs thrown into the earth then the squabbles of the management the panics of the shareholders the struggle with the lords of the soil who were resolved not to recognize royal concessions if no treaty was first made with themselves he had at last founded the association of de romans faquinois and company to exploit the Monceau concession and the pits began to yield a small profit when two neighboring concessions that of Cogny, belonging to the comte de Cogny, and that of oisel belonging to the corneille and Jeannard company had nearly overwhelmed him beneath the terrible assault of their competition happily on the twenty fifth august seventeen sixty a treaty was made between these three concessions uniting them into a single one the Monceau mining company was created such as it still exists to-day in the distribution they had divided the total property according to the standard of the money of the time into twenty-four sous of which each was subdivided into twelve deniers which made two hundred and eighty-eight deniers and as the denier was worth ten thousand francs the capital represented a sum of nearly three millions de Ramon, dying but triumphant received in this division six sous and three deniers in those days the baron possessed Bielin, which had three hundred hectares belonging to it and he had in his service as steward honore gregoire a picardy lad the great-grandfather of leon gregoire cecile's father when the Monceau treaty was made honore who had laid up savings to the amount of some fifty thousand francs yielded tremblingly to his master's unshakable faith he took out ten thousand francs in fine crowns and took a denier though with the fear of robbing his children of that sum his son eugene in fact received very small dividends and as he had become a bourgeois and had been foolish enough to throw away the other forty thousand francs of the paternal inheritance in a company that came to grief he lived meanly enough but the interest of the denier gradually increased the fortune began with Felicien he was able to realize a dream with which his grandfather the old steward had nursed his childhood the purchase of dismembered violin which he acquired as national property for a ludicrous sum however bad years followed it was necessary to await the conclusion of the revolutionary catastrophes and afterwards napoleon's bloody fall and it was leon gregoire who profited at a stupefying rate of progress by the timid and uneasy investment of his great-grandfather these poor ten thousand francs grew and multiplied with the company's prosperity from eighteen twenty they had brought in one hundred per cent ten thousand francs in eighteen forty four they had produced twenty thousand in eighteen fifty forty during two years the dividend had reached the prodigious figure of fifty thousand francs the value of the denier quoted at the lille bourse at a million had centupled in a century m gregoire who had been advised to sell out when this figure of a million was reached had refused with his smiling paternal air six months later an industrial crisis broke out the denier fell to six hundred thousand francs but he still smiled he regretted nothing for the gregoires had maintained an obstinate faith in their mind it would rise again god himself was not so solid then with his religious faith was mixed profound gratitude towards an investment which for a century had supported the family in doing nothing it was like a divinity of their own whom their egoism surrounded with a kind of worship the benefactor of the hearth lulling them in their great bed of idleness fattening them at their gluttonous table from father to son it had gone on why risk displeasing fate by doubting it and at the bottom of their fidelity there was a superstitious terror a fear lest the million of the denier might suddenly melt away if they were to realize it and to put it in a drawer it seemed to them more sheltered in the earth from which a race of miners generations of starving people extracted it for them a little every day as they needed it for the rest happiness reigned on this house
monsieur grégoire when very young had married the daughter of a marchand druggist a plain penniless girl whom he adored and who repaid him with happiness she shut herself up in her household and worshipped her husband having no other will but his no difference of tastes separated them their desires were mingled in one idea of comfort and they had thus lived for forty years in affection and little mutual services it was a well-regulated existence the forty thousand francs were spent quietly and the savings expended on cecile whose tardy birth had for a moment disturbed the budget they still satisfied all her whims a second horse two more carriages toilettes sent from paris but they tasted in this one more joy they thought nothing too good for their daughter although they had such a horror of display that they had preserved the fashions of their youth every unprofitable expense seemed foolish to them suddenly the door opened and a loud voice called out hallo what now having breakfast without me it was cecile just come from her bed her eyes heavy with sleep she had simply put up her hair and flung on a white woolen dressing-gown no no said the mother you see we are all waiting eh has the wind prevented you from sleeping poor darling the young girl looked at her in great surprise has it been windy i didn't know anything about it i haven't moved all night then they thought this funny and all three began to laugh the servants who were bringing in the breakfast also broke out laughing so amused was the household at the idea that mademoiselle had been sleeping for twelve hours right off the sight of the brioche completed the expansion of their faces what is it cooked then said cecile that must be a surprise for me that'll be good now hot with the chocolate they sat down to table at last with the smoking chocolate in their cups and for a long time talked of nothing but the brioche melanie and honorine remained to give details about the cooking and watched them stuffing themselves with greasy lips saying that it was a pleasure to make a cake when one saw the masters enjoying it so much but the dogs began to bark loudly perhaps they announced the music mistress who came from marchiennes on mondays and fridays a professor of literature also came all the young girl's education was thus carried on at piolaine in happy ignorance with her childish whims throwing the book out of the window as soon as anything wearied her it is monsieur denoulin said honorine returning behind her denoulin a cousin of monsieur grégoire's appeared without ceremony with his loud voice his quick gestures he had the appearance of an old cavalry officer although over fifty his short hair and thick moustache were as black as ink yes it is i good day don't disturb yourselves he had sat down amid the family's exclamations they turned back at last to their chocolate have you anything to tell me asked m grégoire no nothing at all Denilin hastened to reply i came out on horseback to rub off the rust a bit and as i passed your door i thought i would just look in cecile questioned him about jeanne and lucy his daughters they were perfectly well the first was always at her painting while the other the elder was training her voice at the piano from morning till night and there was a slight quiver in his voice a disquiet which he concealed beneath bursts of gaiety m grégoire began again and everything goes well at the pit well i am upset over this dirty crisis ah we are paying for the prosperous years they have built too many workshops put down too many railways invested too much capital with a view to a large return and to-day the money is asleep they can't get any more to make the whole thing work luckily things are not desperate i shall get out of it somehow like his cousin he had inherited a denier in the Montsou mines but being an enterprising engineer tormented by the desire for a royal fortune he had hastened to sell out when the denier had reached a million for some months he had been maturing a scheme his wife possessed through an uncle the little concession at vandame where only two pits were open jean bart and gaston marie in an abandoned state and with such defective material that the output hardly covered the cost 
now he was meditating the repair of jean bart the renewal of the engine and the enlargement of the shaft so as to facilitate the descent keeping gaston marie only for exhaustion purposes they ought to be able to shovel up gold there he said the idea was sound only the million had been spent over it and this damnable industrial crisis broke out at the moment when large profits would have shown that he was right besides he was a bad manager with a rough kindness towards his workmen and since his wife's death he allowed himself to be pillaged and also gave the rein to his daughters the elder of whom talked of going on the stage while the younger had already had three landscapes refused at the salon both of them joyous amid the downfall and exhibiting in poverty their capacity for good household management you see leon he went on in a hesitating voice you were wrong not to sell out at the same time as i did now everything is going down you run risk and if you had confided your money to me you would have seen what we should have done at vandame in our mine m grégoire finished his chocolate without haste he replied peacefully never you know that i don't want to speculate i live quietly and it would be too foolish to worry my head over business affairs and as for Monceau, it may continue to go down we shall always get our living out of it it doesn't do to be so diabolically greedy then listen it is you who will bite your fingers one day for Monceau will rise again and cecile's grandchildren will still get their white bread out of it Denelin listened with a constrained smile then he murmured if i were to ask you to put a hundred thousand francs in my affair you would refuse but seeing the grégoire's disturbed face as he regretted having gone so far he put off his idea of a loan reserving it until the case was desperate oh i have not got to that it is a joke good heavens perhaps you are right the money that other people earn for you is the best to fatten on they changed the conversation cecile spoke again of her cousins whose tastes interested while at the same time this shocked her madame grégoire promised to take her daughter to see those dear little ones on the first fine day m grégoire however with a distracted air did not follow the conversation he added aloud if i were in your place i wouldn't persist any more i would treat with monceau they want it and you will get your money back he alluded to an old hatred which existed between the concession of monceau and that of vandame in spite of the latter's slight importance its powerful neighbour was enraged at seeing enclosed within its own sixty-seven communes the square league which did not belong to it and after having vainly tried to kill it had plotted to buy it at a low price when in a failing condition the war continued without truce each party stopped its galleries at two hundred metres from the other it was a duel to the last drop of blood although the managers and engineers maintained polite relations with each other Denelin's eyes had flamed up never he cried in his turn monceau shall never have vandame as long as i am alive i dined on thursday at Hambo's, and i saw him fluttering around me last autumn when the big man came to the administration building they made me all sorts of advances yes yes i know them those marquises and dukes and generals and ministers brigands who would take away even your shirt at the corner of a wood he could not cease besides m grégoire did not defend the administration of monceau the six stewards established by the treaty of seventeen sixty who governed the company despotically and the five survivors of whom on every death chose the new member among the powerful and rich shareholders the opinion of the owners of Pelain, with his reasonable ideas was that these gentlemen were sometimes rather immoderate in their exaggerated love of money melanie had come to clear away the table outside the dogs were again barking and honorine was going to the door when cecile who was stifled by heat and food left the table no never mind it must be for my lesson Denelin had also risen he watched the young girl go out and asked smiling well and the marriage with little negrel nothing has been settled said madame grégoire 
it is only an idea we must reflect no doubt he went on with a gay laugh i believe that the nephew and the aunt what baffles me is that madame hennebeau should throw herself so on cecile's neck but m grégoire was indignant so distinguished a lady and fourteen years older than the young man it was monstrous he did not like joking on such subjects Denolin, still laughing shook hands with him and left not yet said cecile coming back it is that woman with the two children you know mamma the miner's wife whom we met are they to come in here they hesitated were they very dirty no not very and they would leave their sabots in the porch already the father and mother had stretched themselves out in the depths of their large easy chairs they were digesting there the fear of change of air decided them let them come in honoring then Mehud and her little ones entered frozen and hungry seized by fright on finding themselves in this room which was so warm and smelled so nicely of the brioche End of section seven. Section eight of Germana by Emile Zola. Translation by Havelock Ellis. The slipper box recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Part two. Chapter two. The room remained shut up, and the shutters had allowed gradual streaks of daylight to form a fan on the ceiling the confined air stupefied them so that they continued their night's slumber lenore and henri in each other's arms alzire with her head back lying on her hump while father bonmort having the bed of zacharie and jalin to himself snored with open mouth no sound came from the closet where Mehud had gone to sleep again while suckling estelle her breast hanging to one side the child lying across her belly stuffed with milk overcome also and stifling in the soft flesh of the bosom the clock below struck six along the front of the settlement one heard the sound of doors then the clatter of sabots along the pavements the screening women were going to the pit and silence again fell until seven o'clock then shutters were drawn back yawns and coughs were heard through the walls for a long time a coffee-mill scraped but no one awoke in the room suddenly a sound of blows and shouts far away made azir sit up she was conscious of the time and ran barefooted to shake her mother 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 it is late you have to go out take care you are crushing estelle and she saved the child half stifled beneath the enormous mass of the breasts good gracious stammered Mahud rubbing her eyes i'm so knocked up i could sleep all day dress lenore and henri i'll take them with me and you can take care of estelle i don't want to drag her along for fear of hurting her this dog's weather she hastily washed herself and put on an old blue skirt her cleanest and a loose jacket of gray wool in which she had made two patches the evening before and the soup good gracious she muttered again when her mother had gone down upsetting everything alzire went back into the room taking with her estelle who had begun screaming but she was used to the little one's rages at eight she had all a woman's tender cunning in soothing and amusing her she gently placed her in her still warm bed and put her to sleep again giving her a finger to suck it was time for now another disturbance broke out and she had to make peace between lenore and henri who at last awoke these children could never get on together it was only when they were asleep that they put their hands round one another's necks the girl who was six years old as soon as she was awake set on the boy her junior by two years who received her blows without returning them both of them had the same kind of head which was too large for them as if blown out with disorderly yellow hair alzire had to pull her sister by the legs threatening to take the skin off her bottom then there was stamping over the washing and over every garment that she put on to them the shutters remained closed so as not to disturb father bonmort's sleep he went on snoring amid the children's frightful clatter it's ready are you coming up there 
shouted maheu she had put back the blinds and stirred up the fire adding some coal to it her hope was that the old man had not swallowed all the soup but she found the saucepan dry and cooked a handful of vermicelli which she had been keeping for three days in reserve they could swallow it with water without butter as there could not be any remaining from the day before and she was surprised to find that catherine in preparing the bricks had performed the miracle of leaving a piece as large as a nut but this time the cupboard was indeed empty nothing not a crust not an odd fragment not a bone to gnaw what was to become of them if maigrat persisted in cutting short their credit and if the piolaine people would not give them the five francs when the men and the girl returned from the pit they would want to eat for unfortunately it had not yet been found out how to live without eating come down will you she cried out getting angry i ought to be gone by this when alzire and the children were there she divided the vermicelli in three small portions she herself was not hungry she said although catherine had already poured water on the coffee dregs of the day before she did so over again and swallowed two large glasses of coffee so weak that it looked like rusty water that would keep her up all the same listen she repeated to alzire you must let your grandfather sleep you must watch that estelle does not knock her head and if she wakes or if she howls too much here take this bit of sugar and melt it and give it her in spoonfuls i know that you are sensible and won't eat it yourself and school mother school well that must be left for another day i want you and the soup would you like me to make it if you come back late soup soup no wait till i come alzire with the precocious intelligence of a little invalid girl could make soup very well she must have understood for she did not insist now the whole settlement was awake bands of children were going to school and one heard the trailing noise of their clogs eight o'clock struck and a growing murmur of chatter arose on the left among the Levac people the women were commencing their day around the coffee-pots with their fists on their hips their tongues turning without ceasing like millstones a faded head with thick lips and flattened nose was pressed against a window-pane calling out got some news stop a bit no no later on replied maheu i have to go out and for fear of giving way to the offer of a glass of hot coffee she pushed lenore and henri and set out with them up above father bonnemort was still snoring with a rhythmic snore which rocked the house outside maheude was surprised to find that the wind was no longer blowing there had been a sudden thaw the sky was earth-coloured the walls were sticky with greenish moisture and the roads were covered with pitch-like mud a special kind of mud peculiar to the coal country as black as diluted soot thick and tenacious enough to pull off her sabots suddenly she boxed lenore's ears because the little one amused herself by piling the mud on her clogs as on the end of a shovel on leaving the settlement she had gone along by the pit bank and followed the road of the canal making a short cut through broken-up paths across rough country shut in by mossy palings sheds succeeded one another long workshop buildings tall chimneys spitting out soot and soiling this ravaged suburb of an industrial district behind a clump of poplars the old requilla pit exhibited its crumbling steeple of which the large skeleton alone stood upright and turning to the right maheu found herself on the high road stop stop dirty pig i'll teach you to make mincemeat now it was henri who had taken a handful of mud and was moulding it the two children had their ears impartially boxed and were brought into good order looking out of the corner of their eyes at the mud pies they had made they dragged along already exhausted by their efforts to unstick their shoes at every step on the martian side the road unrolled its two leagues of pavement which stretched straight as a ribbon soaked in cart grease between the reddish fields but on the other side it went winding down through monceau 
which was built on the slope of a large undulation in the plain these roads in the nord drawn like a string between manufacturing towns with their slight curves their slow ascents gradually get lined with houses and tend to make the department one laborious city the little brick houses daubed over to enliven the climate some yellow others blue others black the last no doubt in order to reach at once their final shade went serpentining down to right and to left to the bottom of the slope a few large two-story villas the dwellings of the heads of the workshops made gaps in the serried line of narrow facades a church also of brick looked like a new model of a large furnace with its square tower already stained by the floating coal dust and amid the sugar works the rope works and the flour mills there stood out ballrooms restaurants and beer shops which were so numerous that to every thousand houses there were more than five hundred inns as she approached the company's yards a vast series of storehouses and workshops maheude decided to take henri and lenoc by the hand one on the right the other on the left beyond was situated the house of the director m hanbeau a sort of vast chalet separated from the road by a grating and then a garden in which some lean trees vegetated just then a carriage had stopped before the door and a gentleman with decorations and a lady in a fur cloak alighted visitors just arrived from paris at the marchiennes station for madame hambeau who appeared in the shadow of the porch was uttering exclamations of surprise and joy come along then dawdlers growled maheude pulling the two little ones who were standing in the mud when she arrived at maigrat's she was quite excited maigrat lived close to the manager only a wall separated the latter's ground from his own small house and he had there a warehouse a long building which opened on to the road as a shop without a front he kept everything there grocery cooked meats fruit and sold bread beer and saucepans formerly an overseer at the baroque he had started with a small canteen then thanks to the protection of his superiors his business had enlarged gradually killing the monceau retail trade he centralized merchandise and the considerable custom of the settlements enabled him to sell more cheaply and to give longer credit besides he had remained in the company's hands and they had built his small house and his shop here i am again monsieur maigret said maheude humbly finding him standing in front of his door he looked at her without replying he was a stout cold polite man and he prided himself on never changing his mind now you won't send me away again like yesterday we must have bread from now to saturday sure enough we owe you sixty francs these two years she explained in short painful phrases it was an old debt contracted during the last strike twenty times over they had promised to settle it but they had not been able they could not even give him forty sous a fortnight and then a misfortune had happened two days before she had been obliged to pay twenty francs to a shoemaker who threatened to seize their things and that was why they were without a sou otherwise they would have been able to go on until saturday like the others maigret with protruded belly and folded arms shook his head at every supplication only two loaves monsieur maigret i am reasonable i don't ask for coffee only two three-pound loaves a day no he shouted at last at the top of his voice his wife had appeared a pitiful creature who passed all her days over a ledger without even daring to lift her head she moved away frightened at seeing this unfortunate woman turning her ardent beseeching eyes towards her it was said that she yielded the conjugal bed to the putters among the customers it was a known fact that when a miner wished to prolong his credit he had only to send his daughter or his wife plain or pretty it mattered not provided they were complacent maheude still imploring maigret with her look felt herself uncomfortable under the pale keenness of his small eyes which seemed to undress her it made her angry she would have understood before she had had seven children when she was young and she went off violently dragging lenore and henri who were occupied in picking up nutshells from the gutter 
where they were making investigations this won't bring you luck monsieur maigret remember now there only remained the Pierlane people if these would not throw her a five franc piece she might as well lie down and die she had taken the choiselle road on the left the administration building was there at the corner of the road a veritable brick palace where the great people from paris princes and generals and members of the government came every autumn to give large dinners as she walked she was already spending the five francs first bread then coffee afterwards a quarter of butter a bushel of potatoes for the morning soup and the evening stew finally perhaps a bit of pig's chitterlings for the father needed meat the cure of Monceau, abbe joueur was passing holding up his cassock with the delicate air of a fat well-nourished cat afraid of wetting its fur he was a mild man who pretended not to interest himself in anything so as not to vex either the workers or the masters good day monsieur le cure without stopping he smiled at the children and left her planted in the middle of the road she was not religious but she had suddenly imagined that this priest would give her something and the journey began again through the black sticky mud there were still two kilometres to walk and the little ones dragged behind more than ever for they were frightened and no longer amused themselves to right and to left of the path the same vague landscape unrolled enclosed within mossy palings the same factory buildings dirty with smoke bristling with tall chimneys then the flat land was spread out in immense open fields like an ocean of brown clods without a tree trunk as far as the purplish line of the forest of vandame carry me mother she carried them one after the other puddles made holes in the pathway and she pulled up her clothes fearful of arriving too dirty three times she nearly fell so sticky was that confounded pavement and as they at last arrived before the porch two enormous dogs threw themselves upon them barking so loudly that the little ones yelled with terror the coachman was obliged to take a whip to them leave your sabbats and come in repeated honorine in the dining-room the mother and children stood motionless dazed by the sudden heat and very constrained beneath the gaze of this old lady and gentleman who were stretched out in their easy chairs cecile said the old lady fulfil your little duties the gregoires charged cecile with their charities it was part of their idea of a good education one must be charitable they said themselves that their house was the house of god besides they flattered themselves that they performed their charity with intelligence and they were exercised by a constant fear lest they should be deceived and so encouraged vice so they never gave money never not ten sous not two sous for it is a well-known fact that as soon as a poor man gets two sous he drinks them their alms were therefore always in kind especially in warm clothing distributed during the winter to needy children oh the poor dears exclaimed cecile how pale they are from the cold honorine go and look for the parcel in the cupboard the servants were also gazing at these miserable creatures with the pity and vague uneasiness of girls who are in no difficulty about their own dinners while the housemaid went upstairs the cook forgot her duties leaving the rest of the brioche on the table and stood there swinging her empty hands i still have two woolen dresses and some comforters cecile went on you will see how warm they will be the poor dears then maheude found her tongue and stammered thank you so much mademoiselle you are all too good tears had filled her eyes she thought herself sure of the five francs and was only preoccupied by the way in which she would ask for them if they were not offered to her the housemaid did not reappear and there was a moment of embarrassed silence from the mother's skirts the little ones opened their eyes wide and gazed at the brioche you only have these two asked madame gregoire in order to break the silence oh madame i have seven monsieur gregoire who had gone back to his newspaper sat up indignantly seven children but why good god it is imprudent murmured the old lady Mehud made a vague gesture of apology what would you have one doesn't think about it at all they come quite naturally 
and then when they grow up they bring something in and that makes the household go take their case they could get on if it was not for the grandfather who was getting quite stiff and if it was not that among the lot only two of her sons and her eldest daughter were old enough to go down into the pit it was necessary all the same to feed the little ones who brought nothing in then said madame gregoire you have worked for a long time at the mines a silent laugh lit up maheu's pale face ah yes ah yes i went down till i was twenty the doctor said that i should stay down for good after i had been confined the second time because it seems that made something go wrong in my inside besides then i got married and i had enough to do in the house but on my husband's side you see they have been down there for ages it goes up from grandfather to grandfather one doesn't know how far back quite to the beginning when they first took the pick down there at Requillon. monsieur gregoire thoughtfully contemplated this woman and these pitiful children with their waxy flesh their discoloured hair the degeneration which stunted them gnawed by anemia and with the melancholy ugliness of starvelings there was silence again and one only heard the burning coal as it gave out a jet of gas the moist room had that heavy air of comfort in which our middle-class nooks of happiness slumber what is she doing then exclaimed cecile impatiently melanie go up and tell her that the parcel is at the bottom of the cupboard on the left in the meanwhile monsieur gregoire repeated aloud the reflections inspired by the sight of these starving ones there is evil in this world it is quite true but my good woman it must also be said that workpeople are never prudent thus instead of putting aside a few sous like our peasants miners drink get into debt and end by not having enough to support their families monsieur is right replied maheu sturdily they don't always keep to the right path that's what i'm always saying to the ne'er-do-wells when they complain now i have been lucky my husband doesn't drink all the same on feast sundays he sometimes takes a drop too much but it never goes farther it is all the nicer of him since before our marriage he drank like a hog begging your pardon and yet you know it doesn't help us much that he is so sensible there are days like to-day when you might turn out all the drawers in the house and not find a farthing she wished to suggest to them the idea of the five-franc piece and went on in her low voice explaining the fatal debt small at first then large and overwhelming they paid regularly for many fortnights but one day they got behind and then it was all up they could never catch up again the gulf widened and the men became disgusted with work which did not even allow them to pay their way do what they could there was nothing but difficulties until death besides it must be understood that a collier needed a glass to wash away the dust it began there and then he was always in the end when worries came without complaining of any one it might be that the workmen did not earn as much as they ought to i thought said madame gregoire that the company gave you lodging and firing maheude glanced sideways at the gleaming coal in the fireplace yes yes they give us coal not very grand but it burns as to lodging it only costs six francs a month that sounds like nothing but it is often pretty hard to pay to-day they might cut me up into bits without getting two sous out of me where there's nothing there's nothing the lady and gentleman were silent softly stretched out and gradually wearied and disquieted by the exhibition of this wretchedness she feared she had wounded them and added with a stolid and just air of a practical woman oh i didn't want to complain things are like this and one has to put up with them all the more that it's no good struggling perhaps we shouldn't change anything the best is is it not to try and live honestly in the place in which the good god has put us Monsieur gregoire approved this emphatically with such sentiments my good woman one is above misfortune honorine and melanie at last brought the parcel cecile unfastened it and took out the two dresses she added comforters even stockings and mittens they would all fit beautifully she hastened and made the servants wrap up the chosen garments for her music mistress had just arrived 
and she pushed the mother and children towards the door oh, we are very short stammered maheude if we only had a five-franc piece the phrase was stifled for the maheus were proud and never begged cecile looked uneasily at her father but the latter refused decisively with an air of duty no it is not our custom we cannot do it then the young girl moved by the mother's overwhelmed face wished to do all she could for the children they were still looking fixedly at the brioche she cut it in two and gave it to them here this is for you then taking the pieces back she asked for an old newspaper wait you must share with your brothers and sisters and beneath the tender gaze of her parents she finally pushed them out of the room the poor starving urchins went off holding the brioche respectfully in their benumbed little hands maheude dragged her children along the road seeing neither the desert fields nor the black mud nor the great livid sky as she passed through montsou she resolutely entered maigrat's shop and begged so persistently that at last she carried away two loaves coffee butter and even her five-franc piece for the man also lent money by the week it was not her that he wanted it was catherine she understood that when he advised her to send her daughter for provisions they would see about that catherine would box his ears if he came too close under her nose End of section eight.